Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, you. Hey, babe. Thanks for lunch. You're welcome. Who is that? That was a representative from the Virgin Islands Department of Health. They're doing a survey called BRFSS. Oh, for what? It's to address chronic diseases facing the Virgin Islands. Diabetes, heart and kidney disease, cancer, stroke, and more. What kind of questions do they ask? They ask questions about food, exercise, age, smoking, and some others. Is that all they ask? Do they ask questions about... Security? No. They don't ask anything about social security, money, or credit card information. The information that they do collect is used to guide public health programs that affect all of us. You, me, the kids, the community, and the entire Virgin Islands. Oh, okay. Very interesting. I'm glad we could do our part to help. Yes, we've got to do our part. For more information, visit our website or call John Orr at 340-643-5422. Hey students, this is Governor Albert Bryan Jr. One of my favorite things to do is read. A good story can fuel the imagination and introduce you to places and characters you've never seen or heard of before. This summer, I'm reading five books and I'm challenging students in grades K through six to do the exact same thing. Take my summer reading challenge and read five books. Choose from the books you have at home or log on to read5.org for a super selection of books you can download for free. Keep track of all the books you've read and submit the tracking sheet online at read5.org or when you return to school. My summer reading challenge ends on September 3rd, 2021. Read five or more, you meet the challenge and you get invited to my big celebration. Stay safe, be good, and read five. Vaccinate yourself like we do. Yeah. You from the field. And you want to get vaccinated, put your hands up by the life you save my behold. If you from the field. And you don't get vaccinated, put your hands on my by. Be vaccinated and pro. So get the vaccine now. So we can get out. With our friends and family together. So we can start back school and full the classroom. So all the kids can pull on back. Get the vaccine now. There's only one. Virgin Islands, get your vaccine. Starting July 9th, the United States Virgin Islands government is giving away a hundred thousand dollars every week for 10 weeks. Only Virgin Islands residents who are fully vaccinated against COVID-19 are eligible. If you've only got part of the vaccine, you can also win fifty thousand dollars. Take your best shot. Let's put the community first and win big. Vaccinate yourself, like we go.
Good day, Virgin Islanders at home and abroad. Welcome to the Government House Weekly Press Briefing and COVID-19 Update for the week of August 16th, 2021. Joining me for this afternoon's update is the Health Commissioner designee for today, Dr. Sims, as well as the Virgin Islands Lottery's very own Mr. Dwayne Benjamin on behalf of Raymond Williams. Um, and he's here to announce all the winners from last week and the week before. What a roller coaster ride of a weekend it has been. A major earthquake in Haiti, two district wide blackouts, enforcement challenges with COVID and mandates, personnel shortages at our hospitals, COVID cases over 400, COVID crisis in our correctional facilities, and tropical storm grace on the way. And yet, the sun came up this morning over our beautiful Virgin Islands, and I wanna thank God for bringing us to yet another Monday safely to tell you what's going on in the territory, what's happening with this COVID. And I do pray that he continues to grant us the mercy that he has saw fit this weekend to put upon us for the remainder of the season. Without further delay, I'll go to Dr. Sims to give you the COVID update. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. As of August 14, 2020, a total of 157,247 tests have been conducted in the territory. Of those tests, 5,295 individuals have tested positive, 151,952 have tested negative. The seven-day positivity rate is 5.39. There are currently 370 active cases in the territory, 238 on St. Thomas, 122 on St. Croix, and 10 on St. John. We have 41 fatalities. The Governor Wong F. Louis Hospital and Medical Center has reported 17 COVID-19 admissions with four patients ventilated, and Schneider Regional Medical Center has reported 22 COVID patients with five ventilated. Of the 39 patients hospitalized across the territory, none are fully vaccinated. So far, 48,756 individuals have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. 39,413 are fully vaccinated. We're asking that you please do your part and call 340-777-8227 or schedule yourself an online appointment at covid19usvi.com slash vaccines. If you are the parent or guardian of a child 12 years and older, please make sure to accompany your child to his or her vaccination appointment. Walk with a valid ID for both you and the child and the child's birth certificate. Testing. While you are being tested or waiting for results from testing, we're asking that you do not traverse the streets. Once you've taken a test, please do not go to any stores or any areas with other persons. Help us to reduce transmission illness, hospitalization, and death. If you have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or know anyone and are a close contact, we're asking you to stay away from others. If you do not live alone, please wear your mask and social distance as much as possible. Anyone can pre-register for pop-up testing online at covid19usvi.com slash testing. The following in our upcoming events. On St. Croix at Charles Howard on Tuesday, August 17th from 10.30 to 12.30. St. Thomas Home Depot, Tuesday, August 17th from 12 to 2. St. John at the Viper Gravel Lot and on August 18th from 1 to 4 p.m. Starting this week, however, we will expand daily drive-through testing to prioritize those who are sick or are a close contact of a positive case. This will replace pop-up testing as of Thursday, August 19th. We are also partnering with private providers to expand testing options due to the current surge and high testing demand. We are asking the community to please schedule their testing online, utilize the hotline or contact private providers directly so that we can better accommodate all those requiring testing at this time. Our hotline numbers are accessible eight a.m. to 10 p.m. for callers to report suspe suspected cases of COVID-19, please call 340-712-6229 or 340-776-1519. 
To keep up with the latest information, please visit the USVI Department of Health Facebook page or our website, www.covid19usvi.com. And for COVID-19 health information alerts, please text COVID-19 USVI to 888-777. And Governor, if you will indulge me for two minutes, I realized just a while ago, um, Today is a year to the date that I sat here in a press conference and mentioned that my niece had been buried because I lost her to COVID-19. Since then, I've lost five additional persons. I don't know how these dates have synced up, but I find myself here again appealing to you and almost begging you to please take this seriously. The data that I've just read is the highest that we have seen. Our hospitals are full. Our staff is burnt out. We are mourning, some of us personally, some of us professionally. We don't know how else to ask, but I'm asking and I'm begging that you please do your research. Understand the importance of vaccination. Understand for yourself. Don't take advice from a neighbor's uncle's friend's doctor who is not treating you. I'm asking on behalf of the Department of Health, my commissioner, the doctors, the nurses, EPI, everybody to please take this seriously as we try to get out of this together. Governor, thank you for your indulgence. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sims, encouraging everybody to go out there and get your vaccine. And uh, one of the other things that she said I just want to stress, if you've been exposed to the virus, please do not go anywhere until you get tested. Once you get tested, do not go anywhere until you get the results. If you test positive, do not go anywhere. Uh, the regular COVID uh, variant, the regular COVID virus, um, you're, you're probably going to affect like maybe two to three people. With the Delta variant, it's six to nine. And that is the reason why we're seeing the numbers that we have now. So stay put and get vaccinated. We are now in the week five of our Vax to Win vaccine lottery, where two vaccinated Virgin Islanders will be eligible to win up to $100,000 every week. We also have concluded our school-based special drawing, and we're here to announce the winners of the August 6th Vax to Win drawing and the August 9th school-based special drawing is the Assistant Executive Director of the Virgin Islands Lottery Office, Mr. Dwayne Benjamin. I know some of these people, so, you know, congratulations and, and hope, hopefully you could be next. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Good afternoon, Virgin Islands. Uh, I'd like to announce uh, last week's winner of the Vax to Win Lottery for the week of August 6th. On the island of St. Croix, the St. Croix District, the winner is Ioni Noel. She's the recipient of $100,000 and the St. Thomas St. John District winner is Barbara Ortega Butcher. She will be receiving $50,000 as she has received only one dose. And is, as indicated by the governor, it is my pleasure to announce the school-based personnel from the special draw for school-based personnel. The St. Croix District winners are as follows. First place, in the amount of $25,000, that individual is Mr. Joseph Augis of the St. Croix Educational Complex. Second prize winner, in the amount of $10,000, Henry Awika of the University of the Virgin Islands. Our third place winner in the amount of $5,000 is Ms. Minerva Delaney of the St. Croix Central High School. Our St. Thomas School-based personnel winners for first place from the Charles de Molly High School is Mr. Vernon Calwood. He is the recipient of $25,000. Second place amount, $10,000, is Mr. Eric Christian from the University of the Virgin Islands. And our third place winner representing St. Peter and Paul School is Mr. Eugene Farrell, He's a recipient of $5,000. So again, it pays to be vaccinated, and I encourage all Virgin Islanders to take this opportunity seriously to get vaccinated. Thank you, Governor. Thank you.
you. Uh, good to see some familiar faces there. What I really like about that is that you have a public school, a private school, and the university participating in the winners. The funny thing is, is, is the university is disproportionately represented. They probably had a booth down there signing people up to win. So congratulations to you both on uh, winning that. Uh, and remember, you can get your uh, $100,000 too. All you got to do is vaccine. And if you don't want to do that, well, we also are offering $250 per person to get vaccinated, making sure that everyone in our community is encouraged as much as possible um, to go out there and get vaccinated. What we're trying to do is we're going to pay out everybody. So please don't go there and harass the health people that you want to um, get your 250 now. We got to get your name, address. We're going to get you a check or we're going to get you a visa card. And you're going to get your money guaranteed. I never let you down before. Um, I'll show you that money. So go out there, take some, take a friend, let them get 250. Your kid is eligible for 252. Um, go out there and, and uh, let's get people vaccinated. Vaccinated. Speaking about our critical personnel, in, in our continued effort to make sure that our frontline workers do what is necessary to protect themselves, their co-workers, their loved ones, and you, the public. We are continuing our series of Vax to Win drawings with a special drawing just for healthcare and allied healthcare workers. This is a special drawing for those of you who are working in our hospitals, clinics, the offices of private physicians, school nurses, EMTs, and other healthcare workers. We will be announcing three winners in each district on October 12th. That's October 12th at our weekly press briefing. The first prize, of course, is $25,000. The second prize is $10,000. And the third prize is $5,000. So we're giving you as much incentive as possible, and we'll continue to do that. Um, you can register at www.vaxtowinusvi.com. If you don't have access to the internet, you could call by Tima's hotline, 777-8227, or register at your community vaccination center. The last day to register your entry into the drawing is October the 1st, so you got almost like two months to do this, a month and a half. But you must prove that you were a healthcare, you were employed in healthcare or allied healthcare at the time of the drawing. So if you get fired last week, you don't qualify. But if you are working in that healthcare field, please, 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 please register for this. This is a great opportunity. And if you're not vaccinated, you know, this here's another 25,000 individual reasons why you should go um, out and get that done. Now, in some non-COVID related news this afternoon, today is a very good day in the Virgin Islands because I had the honor of signing into law the legislation to repay the 8% cut taken from government employees in 2011. As a result of our administration's efforts, the government of the Virgin Islands can make good on this and other long-standing obligations and realize additional revenue without having to add fees or raise taxes for nine years of all kinds of different schemes to pay back the 8% owed to the government empl employees. I am proud today to say that the Brian Roach administration because of our management, our stewardship, our hard work, and our taking care of your public dollars has set the government of the Virgin Islands in a financial position to make those employees whole. I can't do it and say that I did it alone. I must thank my Democratic colleagues in the legislature that made it happen. Working together, Democrats make it work. And just today, I had Senator Novel Francis, as well as our esteemed Senate President, uh, Donna Fred Gregory, up here for a signing of that bill. Very good day for us in the Virgin Islands. This is what happens when we work together. When Democrats work together to pull us through any type of crisis, we will figure it out. Next tackle, the GRS, I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do there. So stay tuned. Good things coming um, to you in the territory. One of the things we learned early in our response to COVID was that we just, you, you can't stop COVID from coming to the island and you can't stop people from becoming infected. It's impossible. We knew the best way to protect our people was not to overwhelm 
our healthcare system. And that's a key concern here because people keep calling me, governor is going over 400, governor is over 300. The key here is the healthcare system. Wearing out our limited resources, our nurses, our doctors, our respiratory therapists, EMTs, what have you. So from the beginning of, of this thing, we always wanted to make sure that we have the capacity to care for and provide life-saving treatment to Virgin Islanders should they become critically ill from the virus. In that time, we also did whatever was necessary really to slow the spread of the virus in our community and make it less likely for our people to contract the virus. Today, with 39 people hospitalized in both our hospitals, we find ourselves uncomfortably close to that point. And what's, you know, even scarier about this is people recover from COVID and they don't leave the hospital. So you're no longer COVID positive, but you may have a lung problem or kidney problem or heart problem or clotting problem that causes you to stay there. So it only reflects the people that tested positive today. And what happens over time is more and more people end up in the hospital and for longer periods of time. And what that causes now is for other people who need to access services not to be able to get them. So it's not that you have an overwhelming amount of people come to your hospital one time. It's the accumulation over time of patient after patient that wears down our health staff. The frightening thing about this is we're in a better place today than we were a year ago in some ways and worse than the next. You see, because even though you don't have COVID, you might just have appendicitis. Because the hospital is full of COVID patients, you may not be able to get care. And that's what we're saying is so important with us, with the advent of this vaccine and about 18 months of information on how the virus spread and how we can protect ourselves. We have that. I say this because the fact remains undisputable. He said it today, you heard Dr. Sim say it, of all the patients we have in the hospital, all of them that we have in our care, care, not one, zero, not one of them is vaccinated. I stress this point because the current surge of hospitalizations and deaths, not just here, but nationwide, is absolutely avoidable. As governor, I take the health and well-being of every single Virgin Islander seriously. This pandemic has only heightened that real concern. I often think about Virgin Islanders we have lost and the loved ones that they have left behind. I think about the Virgin Islanders who are currently hospitalized in our hospitals fighting for their best fight against this virus. I think about the many Virgin Islanders who have had the virus and now find themselves unable to do the things they had once enjoyed because of the long-term impact of the virus and what it does to their health. For these reasons, I get really passionate about everybody getting vaccine. And I'm sure you could see the frustration and the stress come through all of these waves that you looking at here, radio, TV, or Facebook. Listen I, I, listen, I know, I know many of you are hesitant about the vaccine for a number of reasons. It's your hesitancy, but I understand and respect your right to choose. It is a choice one way, one way or the other, and you have to do the things that are right for you, that feel right for you and your family. That's a tremendous burden, and it's not easy. But Tregenza and I have an even bigger responsibility. See, it's to 110,000 souls or more that live in the territory, and we don't take that responsibility lightly. See, this is not about vaccinated against the unvaccinated. This is, a, this is not about drawing lines of division between our people. We don't want that. See, I am the governor, and he is the lieutenant governor. 
of all the Virgin Islanders. Despite where we fall on this issue, vaccinated or non-vaccinated, we care about all of you, not just some. But this, this is about the health and safety of the Virgin Islands community. The only line in the sand is that the data shows to exist is a line between survival and severe illness and death. I do not want to see not one more Virgin Islander lose their life to the virus. I hope that you find it in yourself to move towards consideration and maybe even vaccination. This virus is robbing too many of our people of their health and far too many of our people of the promises of an unfulfilled life. I do not want to see any more Virgin Islands families mourn the loss of a loved one. And we, we don't want to mourn anymore. Any one of these 5,000 people or so in the territory who have contracted this virus, each one of them weigh heavy on my mind. The people who survived and the people who didn't survive. And I also think about the price of what this is going to cost us for years to come. Not in dollars, but in all those school days that we're missing and students are not getting that education. What's that going to mean 5, 10, 15 years down the line for these students? The opportunities that would have come to fruit because maybe you missed that wedding or you missed that trip or you missed that job opportunity or you couldn't go here or there because of COVID. Maybe even a special someone you were supposed to meet and get married to. I think about all the wasted time that we have that we could never get back as a result of the virus and this pandemic. And I also think about how much more time you see, I was getting frustrated last week, but I changed my perspective. Because when you see the light at the end of the tunnel, you're feeling happy. Even if you're tired, your step get peppy. When that light disappearing, you get despondent. Well, folks, the light is at the end of the tunnel is gone. We have to run faster to see the light again. Not just us, but globally. We got to remember that this thing is going to be here with us another year and a half, two years. We have some of the resources to fight it, and you have some of the resources to fight it. Remember, all these decisions now, a bill soon going to come. It'll come due. Prices, each and every one that we'll have to pay from this current surge, the one before, and the ones that we will experience in days and years to come. All I'm saying is, we as a community, despite our individual hesitancy, our individual fears, we may be quite valid. We have to make health and safety of the entire community our priority and our choice. Please, take your best shot. This vaccine is definitely saving lives. And I wanted to save yours. Thank you. I'll take any questions from the press. Let's see by night, St. Croix Avis. So um, my first question, I guess, is directed at Dr. Sims. Um, I understand that the Department of Health has um, weekly COVID updates from the hospitals. And so I'm wondering, you know, given the precipitous rise in cases at Schneider Regional Medical Center, they've now overtaken um, Juan F. Louis, who still is very high with COVID cases. What are the boots on the ground saying, um, or the, the management at the hospital? Like, what, what are the situations at Schneider Regional Medical and um, JFL? So as reported, we have uh, 17 persons, COVID uh, patients in JFL and 22 at Schneider Regional Medical Center. My health commissioner, uh, Hussein Kanasiung, held meetings all of last week to include our federal partners. We also had a, held a tabletop exercise for possible 
patient movement. And that is because we want to be able to build a foundation that will be a seamless move if we do have to move patients uh, to receive care from one district to another. Right now, the Department of Health and hospitals are working hand in hand to monitor the patients that are in there. As the governor mentioned, not every patient is a critical COVID active positive patient, but there are individuals who are still reeling from the virus. And so there's a daily uh, meeting that takes place that provides us with the information and education from the hospital so we're able to make better decisions when it comes to patient care. And um, Dr. Sim, I would just like nice, to follow up. Um, uh, politically correct answer, it was <laughs> nice, but they're frustrated and they're damn tired and, you know, uh, of having to deal with patients. You gotta remember, you know, I think people forget that we are people, like, it's not only the tiredness of having to deal with COVID, it's the tiredness of seeing your friends and family die. Uh, you know, it's a tired of seeing really sick people. You know, up to last night, my brother was telling me, really, there's, there's no real prescribed treatment for COVID. You know, there's no COVID medicine. There's only COVID vaccine. You get the monoclonal antibodies, and we hope to help you. And then after that, you know, you, you just could do our best to manage the symptoms and let you ride this thing out. So they are very tired. This weekend, Commissioner and Canacion, I have to t keep telling her, please get some rest. I hope she's home sleeping now. That's why she said Dr. Sims. <laughs> but I know that's not true. Um, you know, getting, we had to get nurses in here from Pafford last week and this week. We have them coming in all the time. Then we have problems getting them registered. Then the hospital nurses think that we're trying to replace them. We are not. We just try and get them some rest. So, this thing gonna be, this is a long haul, like I said. And so we spent this weekend trying to get nurses in, get them managed, and some new strategies that we're gonna try to do, like home health care, so that, and, and following patients from time they get uh, tested and diagnosed, so that we could know and get to them before they get too bad when they show up in the emergency room and we can't help. What can, so we're, what we're working on now is strategies to keep you out of the hospital, strategies to allow you to leave the hospital earlier and get home health care, strategies to enforce the, uh, the resources we have at our hospital, and things we can do to incentivize our, our hospital staff. And, and I don't mean to say hospital, I mean all medical personnel because everybody, doctor's offices, everybody's a little bit exhausted at this point. So Whatever we could do, if we got to send a masseuse in there, massage the box, send them to the beach, whatever we got to do to keep their spirit up, give them incentives, we're going to do that because we support them. They are a real uh, backbone of our lifeline. Awesome. And just to piggyback on that, um, I, I was just wondering if I could get an update on that increased staffing effort. I understand it was seven that came into St. Croix a couple weeks ago. So where we are with that number and when we can expect them to be registered. That, don't, that isn't, we don't have a final, I think the last thing I heard is that we, our goal is to get 46 new members in, and we're, we had a problem in St. Croix, and we were sending the majority there, so we split them. Um, I, I have to get back to you, Lasiba, on exactly how many uh, nurses, physical therapists, and EMTs we have brought in. All right, thank you so much, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Ernest? Yes, Gov, good afternoon, few good questions. Afternoon. Um, first one is relative to the $250 uh, vaccine lottery incentive, not lottery, vaccine incentive you spoke of last week. So folks who uh, were getting their second dose of a COVID-19 vaccine would receive $250. Um, and so we've been getting a lot of calls actually about folks stating that there's some confusion regarding that. So they, some folks said they went to get their second shot and the person's at those locations would say they don't have uh, information about it, that it is not final and stuff like that. Or, or I even heard one folk, well, someone called us and said they called government house and not even government house could have led them to proper information. So, so what is going on there? So when I, well, thank you, Ernest, for asking that because we did need to um, clarify that. So when I said this originally, what I meant was everybody who got their first shot from Monday that I said it, and then during the three weeks or whatever till October, you'd get your second shot and then only those people. 
Subsequent to that, the same thing happened. People start calling me, well, why if I get my second shot? Really, you weren't supposed to be valid because we already incentivized you to take the first. But we will honor the people that got their second shot between the Monday date and I think the October cutoff. So don't worry about it. We got you. You'll get you 250. So, so Gov, for, for the clarity there, it is only valid for folks who will, will get in. Uh, explain that again, Gov. I, I didn't when really I, get it. When I, I originally know. said it, it was for people to be incentivized to take their first shot, and only mm. those people would have gotten paid when they took their second. Because right. of all the people calling me and, and saying foul and calling you, we're just going to pay anybody who got a shot between the day I said it and the day it's cut off is going to get a check. But you have to have your second shot. So you got to get your second shot before October. Um, so you better get that done in, in – because um, if you don't get it by the first week in September, then you're not going to qualify for the 250 because you need your second shot to get it. And it takes three weeks Excellent. before shots. Between Excellent, shots, Thanks for that. You're welcome. Um, Booster COVID shots. So, of course, the uh, FDA approved that for for, for folks with uh, compromised uh, immune systems. Uh, the FDA approved that. Uh, of course, in the states, we are part of the states. Uh, when is that availability going to be ready in the territory? So, when will the Department of Health uh, uh, be able to provide those in in our community with uh, weak immune systems or compromised immune systems with the uh, Pfizer and Moderna booster shots? I think for that, uh, people should check with their physician, um, their private physician, and their physician could give them information on whether they need to have a booster or not. It's not anything special. It's the same thing. You just get another shot. So, you know, I don't think the Department of Health should be taking on that responsibility to determine whether you need the booster or not. Um, you should see your private physician. And relative to the booster, a little clarity there, is it just a, another COVID shot? Uh, yeah. Do you have any? Okay. The second one is a booster too. You know, it's one, you get the first shot, you get the booster, and then now they're saying you could get another booster if you have a, a compromised immune, immune system. Okay. Uh, I've got two more here. Uh, relative to the the, 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 the the physicians coming from Parford Medical Services, you said you don't have a solid number on, on, on what that is, but I think there were, someone sent us a flyer there and they were promoting $20,000 a month packages, uh, PAFOD, uh, that those traveling nurses would, um, would be receiving on a monthly basis. You, you familiar with that? No. Uh, when, I, when we needed these uh, personnel, we didn't really pay attention to how much it cost. We paid more attention to what the cost would be if we didn't get them. Um, I don't know if it's $20,000 a month. It is expensive, but we don't have a choice. Uh, one thing that I call Pafford uh, complaining about this, and they pointed out to me that their rates are two to three times higher in the States. And right now, everybody has a crisis, so we have to do what we have to do to keep them here. They also agree with me, uh, agree to work with us in order to get uh, some of these people placed permanently here who are willing to do that on our hospital and our health staff so that we could um, ease some of these uh, all these expenses as this is an emergency um this is life or death so that's not really the concern right now um but they have agreed to work with us so we're we have a good working relationship with them i mean ain't everybody could show up and get 40 nurses on the drop of a dime um so we're really appreciative to the popper team for what they're helping us do now yes gov um so I am the concern there, and I agree with you. You know, not, not necessarily the cost because you know trying to save lives here, but rather are we able to pay it? So you're talking about tens of millions of dollars uh, if those um, the, if those physicians, those nurses, were to stay, for example, for one year. And you just mentioned that we might be facing this thing for one or two years mm -hmm. um, additional. Um, are we able? Do we have the financial resources uh, to to meet those costs? The feds gave us $515 million to fight COVID. Um, we weren't even using that money to pay Pafford. Pafford was being paid on a FEMA project worksheet. Um, so we're pursuing that method of payment for them. If, if you know, we, we have to, we have figured out a way to pay them. We just, we just want our people alive. We don't, I don't, you know, the, how much it's costing me now is a concern because you know I don't like to spend money. But right now, <laughs> we just need to get people in place. So... 
We're looking at what our long-term plans will be. We don't plan, to, I'm not doing this six months from now, um, 90 days from now maybe, but not six months from now. We gotta get people in permanently because we're looking at a two, three year stint here that we're gonna be dealing with this and not only getting people in, but paying our people fairly too and it's encouraging them to keep on because it's rough. I mean, and it's, it's, it's equally rough mentally to have to have been dealing with this and then to see somebody come in making two, three times as much as you and then you ain't gain anything except a pat on your back and thank you. So, we, you know, we're going to look out for our people too. Um, we, have the, we have the resources to pay them and we're going to pay them too. Thanks, we're finally here. Um, we will ask to ask for an update on stimulus payments. I know the administration has about dispersed just about everything. Are, are there some stragglers? Uh, people are asking about that as well. Well, we're paying. As people file, we're paying. Um, like I say, if you have a problem, you call uh, BIR. Sometimes it's a last check or, you know, somebody get a check and hold it. So, you know, we, we're paying people as we go. I mean, there's, there's a problem with Social Security I keep hearing over and over again. I'm looking into that as well, too. There's some of the Social Security recipients that did not get checks. If you didn't, please call um, BIR and let them know so we could get you that cash. All right? Gov, thank you. Hey, thank you, Ernest. Appreciate you. Uh, D Diana Diaz. Good afternoon, Governor. This is Diana Diaz with the BI Source. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the 8% returning to government employees. When can employees expect to see this reflected on their checks? We want to, we want to, we got to close out the fiscal year, which is October. Um, we want to close it out first, and then we want to cut those checks either late October, early in November for the holidays. Um, it's a lot of money to pay out in one time. We figure it's going to be about $45, $50 million. We just want to make sure that we have enough money to pay that out and still keep our cash cool because um, last, we've already promised people we're going to make some payout of taxes in September. Um, we also have the child tax credit that coming out, which reminds me, if you're listening to this and you got a, a PBT card, the food stamp card for uh, last year for your student and your student is still in school, you need to check that card. We've refilled those. There's probably about $1,100 on your card per child. So that's money you don't want to pass up. If you lost your card, can't find it, please reach out to our human services um, uh, department uh, so they can get you situated. But yeah, we want, we want to pay that in November. Um, as you know, going into the new year, we always cash strap. We want to make sure that our money ain't funny when we pay out this $50 million. Um, we want to make sure we got good backup. So right now we're holding strong at about 57, 58 days cash on hand. And uh, we just don't want to jeopardize that, that position. And with the storm season coming and everything else, we want to make sure that we have some money to take care of you in other ways if anything happens. Thank you. All right. Uh, with the multiple government office closes, closed like the BMV on St. Thomas, the No Child Goes Hungry program for St. Thomas and St. John, and also a distribution site for laptops at the Pro B. Larson uh, School. They also suspended all um, their distribution because of COVID exposure. What contingencies are in place for these vital programs and when can we expect some type of update, updated information? Well, I mean, we send out information every day, uh, Diane, but the real, I, I'm glad people are noticing because that's a real cost. I mean, all those employees are being paid by you, the taxpayer, and they're not going home and they're at home, you know, they're not at work because either they're sick or they're scared they're sick or they just have to sit down outside of the agency. And not everybody can work from home. So we're losing money every single day. This is why when we put on these vaccine mandates and the different things we're gonna do. Um, what are the alternative? The alternative is to shut the entire government down, which I'm running away from and have been for uh, the last couple of weeks. But these are all the, 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 the sub costs that go on when we talk about what COVID impact is. Uh, people not being able to access our offices, get licensed, get um, services, critical services. You know, it's, it's a pain. And it, every single week we have two, three government offices closing down. And if one person in the office gets sick, we got we to gotta clean the whole place, which is another expense to us as well, too. So, like I said, we're... We haven't implemented it as yet, but we're moving towards mandatory testing every week for government workers. So 
we can start to serve the public in the right kind of way again. All right, you mentioned the testing schedule just now. Uh, do, do we have a timeline on that? And uh, do we know what, at what point will you consider the vaccine mandate for government, government workers? Well, that's what I'm talking about. That's a mandatory testing. So what we're looking at is trying to implement a mandatory t testing weekly or biweekly. Um, like I said, the challenge is, is, you know, with 400 people in the territory with COVID, we don't want to tie up the testing resources, which are limited, with, with 3,000 government workers going to test every week. Um, that's counterproductive. And then people who are really infected can't get to um, there to get tested and continue to spread. So we're, we're, we're looking at trying to implement it in, in September sometime. Um, but first, we're going to do everything and try everything to get people vaccinated. We need 15,000 people. Um, the good news, folks, is we're up to 1,200 people getting vaccinated weekly. That's, that means what we're doing is working. So we'll continue to rub backs and carry you and cajole you and do everything we can to encourage you to get that vaccine so we could get to, um, I think the number is 65 or 70,000 we want to get to in order to be good again for vaccines. All right, one last question concerning WAPA and its scheduled rolling blackouts on St. Thomas. Is this gonna become the norm? What needs to happen at the Harley power plant for this to end? Well, they've been having problems with unit 23. Again, it was an aging unit. Remember uh, those three ward sillers that we ordered, they should be just about here now and installed. Once we do that, then we'll condemn that old unit. And, you know, conversations are, are, have been arising about different things that we could do, but I think one of the most important things is getting our renewables up and then getting our batteries um, installed. We're trying to push that along quickly so that even when we have power outages, everything doesn't go down. So right now the units, uh, they're running them lean and they're still having problems in the system. So we're just uh, trying to repair units as we go, but hopefully we'll get these um, new ward citizen, and that will stop that uh, rolling blackouts or anything else of the matter because we lost the entire plant twice this weekend um, because of that old, I think it's Unit 23 that's been giving them problem, which carries the mother load of um, St. Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. That's it. Fantastic people. Remember, you can get vaccinated today register to win the health challenge, um, the vaccine challenge. You're already registered if you took one. If you're not, take one. Uh, lots of stuff out there to win. Lots of opportunities coming your way. Um, thank you again to the legislature, my good friend, Senate President Donna Fred Gregory and Mr. Novell Francis, the Vice President of Legislature, uh, for doing that signing with me today. And all the Democratic senators there in the Senate, thank you. Stay safe, stay sanitized, love you.